For those who don't know me, my name is Andrew Bremner, and this is my 13th year here at Shining Mountain. And the title of my project is, is Building and Understanding a Mechanical Clock. To begin my project, I knew I had a couple interests in mind. I wanted to create a physical object and that I had an interest in mechanical engineering. So I began my search. In my search, I came across a website called lisaboyer.com. On this website, there's a man named Clinton Boyer who has designed a bunch of mechanical wooden clocks. And after looking through them, I chose a clock called Inclination. Here's a mechanical drawing of that clock. This design requires 60 plus pieces, and 40 of which are made out of wood. And here you can see a bunch of the pieces I made. So I'll unveil it now. So now that I knew what I wanted to do, I needed to find a mentor. Uh, the ideal mentor was someone with an engineering background and someone who had a background in woodworking. And luckily for me, I had someone right in the community who has that background. So I called up Rick Cantwell and he agreed to be my mentor throughout my process. To begin my project, I had to use some machines and tools, of course, to cut out all the pieces. The main, main, the main machine I used is a scroll saw that I borrowed from Rick Cantwell, who let me borrow it for about six months. I'll return it eventually, I guess. <laughs> and for all the other machines, uh, I was lent a key to the SMWS wood shop, and I used the, the machines there. For the materials, I used plywood for all the gears and the other pieces, like the hands, hardwood for the frame, and brass rods and tubes for the arbors, which are these, these, uh, these rods going across that hold that are the axles on which the gears spin. So the gears, or the wheels as they're called in the plans, uh, are made out of plywood, as I said, and I cut them all on a scroll saw. And I, I cut all the teeth on the scroll saw and drilled through them with a drill press. Now there's 11 gears and they, they total 373 teeth. That's 373 hand-cut teeth with a, with a scroll saw. That's quite a bit of time. For the frame, I used cherry hardwood and maple hardwood. The cherry for the frame, uh, the sideboards, and maple for the base. I used a plunge router to cut these grooves that you can see that uh, this will roll down. A band saw to cut out the actual pieces. Planes to make them very smooth and perfectly nice. and the drill press and Rick's drill press to cut, through, to cut the holes in them. Now I use Rick's drill press instead of the, the SMWS drill press because it is more perfect in that there's a more perfect 90 degree angle between the drill bit and the wood and precision was key throughout this entire process. Now let's shift gears so to speak. <laughs> And so the clock uses the weight as energy and converts it into time. And each gear is calculated very precisely. But how does it work, right? So the pendulum starts the process. The pendulum swings back and forth and moves this piece right here, or right there. You can see it's called the pallet piece. And it moves it back and forth, releasing the escape wheel right here, one tooth, every pendulum swing. So, and it has 30 teeth, so every 30 pendulum swings is one revolution of the escape wheel. The escape wheel pinion, right here, an pinion is a small gear on the same arbor that, that has a specific amount of teeth to the next gear so that there's a certain ratio. So as you can see it right here has eight teeth, and this one, the third wheel, has 76 teeth. Now the third wheel pinion, which you can see in there, has eight teeth as well. And the center wheel right here has 76 teeth also. So if you do the math there, you get 2,707.5 swings equals one center wheel revolution. So all those, all those ratios are to make this one gear right here spin at a certain rate. But why is that important is because the minute hand right here is on that same line and on the same arbor, as you can see across to here. 
So this, uh, whenever the center wheel makes one revolution, the minute hand makes one revolution, so one hour. The cannon pinion right there has 10 teeth and it spins the minute wheel which has 30 teeth. That then spins the minute wheel pinion right here which has 8 teeth which spins the hour, hour wheel as well as the hour hand which has 32 teeth. So if you do the math there you find that the minute hand spins 12 times and the hour hand spins once just like a clock should be if you know how a clock works. So through all that, all the gears are very set and fixed. The only variable is the pendulum and how fast it goes back and forth. So as I told you earlier, 2,707.5 swings is one hour, which then makes 45.1 swings per minute, 0.752 swings per second, which is also 1.33 seconds per swing. So it turns out, that time is a function of the pendulum's length. Now this was rather surprising to me because I would have thought that it would have been the weight and it turns out the weight is really only for friction. So like a true engineer, I looked up the equation to find the pendulum's length. As you can see, time right here and then the force of gravity is G and doing all that, uh, using the equation, I found that the pendulum from here to here needs to be 17.3 uh, inches. Now since I made the clock at, uh, in Boulder, Colorado where gravity is a little less, I made about 17.2. <laughs> so now that I had and understood the clock and I had most of the pieces, I was able to assemble it. And I assembled the whole clock and it did not work. <laughs> so I had to take it apart many, many times and refine everything, re-put it together, retest it, and resand and retest. And through this process, I found that the escape wheel, as I said earlier, and the pallet were two of the main pieces that were really key in getting perfect. So the pallet right here is connected to the pendulum through the pallet crutch arm, this piece right here. So whenever the pendulum swings out like this, the pendulum goes, the pallet piece goes into the escape wheel and when it swings back, it goes back in. But through that process, the escape wheel needs to spin one tooth. So the length is very, very precise. So as you can see here, I even added some hardwood to this to make it the right length. And I sanded them to be very, very smooth. So eventually I found the perfect match and it began ticking. This was the absolute best moment. <laughs> After months and months of work, I had something that had life and it actually moved. But at this point, I had only been pulling on a gear or on this string to make it move. I hadn't, I hadn't attached any weight yet. So I had to build the weight still. So calculating the weight, I used a scale and found that I needed about 10 pounds of weight to make the clock move smoothly. As you can see here, there's a 10 pound dumbbell actually uh, hanging off of that. So seeing how much space I had, I needed something very dense and heavy. So I knew that lead had to be the answer. So I called up Phil McMahon and he helped me make, make the weights. So we melted down some lead shot that we got and uh, we poured the, the lead, the molten lead into bean cans and let it cool. The next morning, we tried to drill through it so that uh, it would fit on the weight trolley, this right here. So we, drilled, we started to drill through and if you don't know, lead is a very soft metal and it, it uh, melts at a very low temperature. So just drilling through it, the drill bit fused with the lead and broke off. <laughs> now we had half a drill bit stuck inside my lead block and no way to get it out. So we tried to cut it with a bandsaw and it fused with that. <laughs> and that broke off as well. Eventually we just cut it in half with a chisel and a hammer and retried it with, half, with two weights that were half the size and drilled through it extremely slowly using lots of uh, water to cool it down. And eventually we got through and all the pieces of my clock were finished. I had my final product and I put it together. So at this point, I'm going to turn the clock on.
So I'm just going to attach the weight to the cord and put it on the tracks. I'll try to get it louder. So since I can't have you guys sit here for four hours watching a clock move, <laughs> I, uh, I made a short uh, time lapse of the clock. So as you can see there, all the pieces together, and you can actually see it moving right there. There you can see the escape wheel pinion and the third wheel actually moving together. There's one half of the pallet and the escape wheel moving nicely. There's the other side. You can actually see the hardwood right there that I glued on. So in the time lapse, which is 360 times the speed, you can see the center wheel right here and the minute wheel, a minute hand spinning at the same rate. And you can really see how much faster this wheel is moving than this. And you can't even see the pendulum moving, how fast it's moving, it's just a blur. And you can also see how slow this is falling. We took a time lapse for four hours and it's, it's wrapping up in a moment. So. So throughout my process and making the clock, I learned a couple lessons. I really enjoy the process of making this. It's, it's really fun for me, even the hard parts of it, even the frustrating parts where it doesn't work. Second, I learned that engineering is really just troubleshooting and it, it really requires patience and diligence and working at it and just keeping with it. This is definitely a field that I would like to pursue in the future, possibly in college and afterwards. And lastly, I would like to thank a few people. Uh, Keith Hayes for letting me use the wood shop. Uh, Phil McMahon for letting me destroy his metal shop. <laughs> and uh, Rick Cantwell, my mentor. Would you please stand? Rick was really always there for me whenever I had a question or anything, and he really helped me through the difficult part where it didn't work, and he, he always believed. He, actually, I guess he didn't believe at the beginning, but uh, <laughs> eventually he believed, and it was really fun to work with him. So thank you, Rick. And uh, are there any questions? The question is, when it didn't work, like, what was my first step, really? So when it first didn't work, I was rather down, kind of, I don't know. <laughs> like, I didn't really know what to do. But after talking with Rick, uh, we, are, we found that the gears were not perfectly symmetrical all the way around. So I, uh, I made them perfectly, perfectly round and sanded all the teeth to make them very, very smooth. So it was really just just redoing everything that I've already done. How do you um, okay. Uh, so you see this this rod right here. If you uh, spin it, it it winds the uh, the weight back up to the top, and uh, it runs for about um, fourteen to sixteen hours. Well, it'll probably stay at my house 
sitting there on my piano. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's, uh, yes? Uh, are there improvements that I could make to this knowing what I know about this clock? Well, yes, there's lots of things I could do to it. I mean, I could make this however much longer you want, so it could run technically 100 hours or something, or 1,000 hours. Also, I would remake the gears to be more perfect because the, I, I made the gears at the very beginning of my project when I didn't really know what I was doing. So uh, they're, they're very flawed, and that would have made all the friction in the, in the clock less, and that would have made it work better. I wouldn't have needed 10 pounds of weight. I would have needed like five pounds. But, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, it's, oh. <laughs> is it accurate? Um, the, uh, as you can see right here on the bottom of the pendulum, there's like a, there's a threaded rod, kind of like a screw if you know what that means. Um, and uh, I can spin it, I can spin the bottom to make the pendulum longer or shorter, and that's how you dictate the time. So if I spend enough time, I could make it exactly perfect. And uh, when I ran it actually in that time lapse, it was about two minutes off over four hours. So, I mean, it's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes? What are your plans for next year? What are my plans for next year? Um, I hope to go to college. <laughs> um, I am uh, applying to many diverse colleges, I don't know, or all the way around the United States. I hope to possibly go into mechanical engineering, either as a major or a uh, grad school thing. And I hope to play basketball. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, no? All right, thank you.